Speaking on Africa Day earlier this year, you acknowledged that Africa has many challenges, COVID-19, of course, uh, poverty, terrorism, amongst many others. But you also said that the Biden administration understands that it needs to focus on the opportunities on the continent and not just the challenges. What are the greatest opportunities that the United States sees on the African continent today? Well, thank you for that question. And let me start by saying before COVID-19 hit, Africa, uh, African economies were some of the fastest growing economies in the world. And somewhere between six out of 10 of the top fastest growing country, uh, countries were on the continent of Africa. I see many opportunities for these countries now to build back better, as we have said here in the United States. And they can build back better with more equitable uh, growth, with more diversity, with more market-based uh, transparent practices and with a focus on climate smart uh, futures. And also I have to add with a focus on equity for, uh, for women who have been key players in, in the market on the con uh, in the marketplace on the continent of Africa. So let me start with climate change. Uh, climate change is it's, it's a challenge for all of us all over the globe, but it also presents a tremendous opportunity to create well paying jobs on the continent of Africa as the world transitions to renewable energies and develop transformational technologies that can help countries reduce uh, emissions and also adapt to uh, climate change. We're committed to making sure, for example, that developing countries can build back greener through public climate financing. Africa with a population of 1.3 billion people with a medium age of 19, 19 uh, uh, Africa's youth are probably one of its greatest resources. There's a tendency to see youth uh, for example, as a problem. But for the continent of Africa, youth are an opportunity and they are an opportunity that the uh, continent needs to take advantage of. This new generation has a different outlook. Uh, they have a, a different approach to, uh, 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 to how they want to uh, see their leadership. And we have an opportunity to uh, mentor and support these young people as we're doing through the Africa, the Young African Leaders Initiative so that we can help them prepare uh, for, uh, for futures in government. And then I will add we uh, participation of women. Women have been uh, more than uh, most uh, victimized by COVID, but they also play a key role in how countries develop. And we have to make sure as countries are building back better that they incorporate the women's uh, perspective in, in their efforts. Madam Ambassador, many African nations are currently experiencing their worst surge in COVID-19 cases and deaths um, since this pandemic began. And it's all largely driven by the Delta variant. What are the most worrying pandemic trends that you are seeing on the continent right now? And what is your assessment of the way African governments have responded to this twin health and economic crises? You know, it, uh, uh, this pandemic has really had a, a, a devastating uh, impact on uh, on the economies of African countries. And as we reflect back on uh, the last 18 months, I have to say that many of the actions that were taken by African leaders to confront COVID-19 early on have saved countless lives. Many of these countries uh, uh, shut down. Uh, many of them had already had experiences dealing with uh, uh, pandemic-like conditions when some of them had to deal with Ebola. I will tell you that I was in Liberia in March of, of uh, 2020 as the, the impact of, of the pandemic began to take hold. And when I arrived in Liberia on March 2nd, they were already at the airport taking temperatures and uh, 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 with hand sanitizer. Uh, and that's before we actually realized what we were going to have to deal with uh, uh, a few weeks later. Uh, Liberia was already prepared. And so many countries made some early decisions that I think 
help them deal with the early stages of the pandemic. But the situation uh, continued to get worse, and particularly as African countries were not able to access uh, the COVID vaccines uh, once these vaccines came on board, and they were not prepared, for example, with the challenges to their very weak healthcare uh, systems. Uh, the, the countries began to, uh, to falter, and with this new Delta variant out there, uh, I think the situation is going to get uh, even, even worse. Uh, you may know President Biden has uh, just announced and pledged that the United States uh, will be the world's arsenal of, of vaccines. I, I love that uh, phrase. And we're working as fast as we can to get shots in arms, not just here in the United States, but through COVAX to get as many vaccines out to the continent of Africa as, as possible, as well as through bilateral uh, donations of vaccines. And so we see that we're not just fighting the disease, we're fighting to secure decades of development progress that the pandemic uh, could, could unwind. So it's important that we get these vaccines out as quickly uh, as possible. Given the opportunities for the US on the African continent and beyond the COVAX commitments, what is America willing to do to ensure that Africa is not left behind as economies all over the world try to recover? Well, uh, it's clear what we are prepared to do, and we're doing it uh, through our actions, and that is getting the COVID vaccine out uh, to the continent of Africa so we can start putting those vaccines in, in arms. But we're also working with countries to help them build back their economies better. We have tremendous programs that work with uh, young people that are working with women, that are working uh, with uh, with finance ministries uh, to support their development uh, agendas through uh, not just USAID, D, but also through DFC, through our engagements with the World Bank and the IMF to ensure that these countries get the injections into their economy, uh, economies that they need to start to jumpstart these economies uh, to start to build their their countries back and develop and to develop a future for uh, for their for their people. International institutions and civil society organizations are sounding the alarm that all the hard won progress on gender equality and women's empowerment is now at risk of being eviscerated. Can you help us understand what is at risk for women right now, especially those on the African continent? And do you think? that any setbacks that we encounter now can be overcome in our lifetime? Well, let, let me start with the last question first. Those setbacks have to be, they, they cannot be, be lasting. We have to do everything possible to ensure that whatever experiences uh, women have right now in Africa that we find a way to turn those around. There's a lot at risk, but it's not just for women and girls, it's for uh, their entire families, because we know that when women are empowered, they empower their families, they empower their communities, they empower their, their countries. And so we have to work with these countries to ensure that the pandemic and, and the alarming numbers that uh, of women worldwide who have been forced to choose between their jobs and uh, and, and their family and their health and their businesses, that they have adequate uh, support uh, to, uh, to move forward. But what we've seen, and, and, uh, and I think what has been so devastating is uh, the impact. Early on, I saw statistics that indicated that child marriages are going up, that uh, the rape of girls in school uh, sexual exploitation of girls in school because they're not in school, school age girls, uh, because they're not in school, that those numbers have gone up significantly. Uh, that um, uh, people are taking uh, advantage of, of women and girls in, in these circumstances. So we have to focus a tremendous amount of our attention on what, uh, on the impact that the pandemic has had on on, on women and girls. We've seen that COVID-19 
does seem to be reversing decades of, of, of hard-won uh, gains for girls, including access to, to education. I saw a UNICEF uh, uh, exhibition at the United Nations where they showed uh, uh, the exhibition had chairs with backpacks, the millions of, of children who are out of school and a significant number, more than 50% are, are, are girls. And so that is something that we have to work uh, to address to not only get vaccines out, but to get girls uh, back, into the, back into the classroom. Uh, the United States uh, knows that peace uh, programs uh, are being impacted uh, because girls, uh, women in, in civil society expand the scope of negotiations and now they're not being uh, included. Uh, in some of those uh, uh, negotiations. And we have to make sure that they are brought back to the table and that they are incorporated in any programs that uh, we are doing across the continent of Africa. Yes, indeed, um, Madam Ambassador, they, uh, the safety of women and education of girls, probably among the most heartbreaking consequences um, and heartbreaking group, heartbreaking stories of the groups that have been affected by this pandemic. The United Nations policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on women says across the globe, women earn less, they save less, they hold less secure jobs and are more likely to be employed in the informal sector. And in some African countries, there are no fiscal relief packages or social safety nets like we see in the United States and in other countries in the West or, or any other sort of benefits to help mitigate this devastating uh, impacts of this pandemic on women's lives and their livelihoods. In your view, what do African governments stand to gain by including women in their economic recovery strategies? And what do they stand to lose, madam, if they don't? Well, we know what they lose if they don't, because we've seen what they have lost because they haven't. Uh, and I think countries are now, leaders are, are, are now more conscious of the importance of having women engage in their country's development plan. Uh, because again, and I say this over and over and over again, when we invest in women, they invest back in their families, they invest in their communities, and they invest, they invest in their countries. And in many of these countries, they represent 50% of the population. You cannot uh, ignore 50% of your population and think that your country is going to grow. So these countries are losing significantly. Uh, if they don't include women in their development plans, they don't include women in, in, in their investment uh, efforts. Uh, they're losing out on what these women might, uh, might contribute to, to their countries. We've seen all across the continent of Africa, successful women run businesses. Uh, and uh, we see the success that women have had in building their communities through civil society uh, activity. Uh, but we've also seen that they've been impacted by uh, the virus uh, much more significantly than other parts of the population. And we need to, for that reason, make sure we give them more attention than we might have otherwise given women as we start to build these economies back. Um, you know, Madam Ambassador, I'm sure you'll agree that if one thing, COVID-19 has left us with many, many, many lessons um, for the future. You're a, lo a long time champion of gender equality. This is part of your life's work, focusing on the rights of women and girls. There's a generation in Africa of well-educated but unemployed youth. Uh, they're struggling through unprecedented and uncertain times. They've been called the pandemic generation. What immediate investments can governments, business, and, and the international community at large make in Africa's youth, especially its girls? Uh, what kind of investments can be made today that will prepare them and build resilience for whatever crisis might come next? You know, when you consider the fact that the median age on the continent of Africa is 19, we started with that. And then you have countries like Niger, where the medium age is 15. If we don't focus on young people, we're ignoring uh, a country. 
half of the population under the age of 19. So it was for that reason, I am most proud of the work that I did and the Obama administration uh, did on supporting young people across the continent of Africa. The Young African Leaders Initiative will be paying dividends on the continent of Africa long after uh, I'm uh, gone from here. And it is something that we all have to make sure that we continue to invest in. Invest in mentoring young people, encouraging young people, supporting the leadership of young people in government, in business, in civil society, uh, in education. Uh, if we don't support this younger generation, uh, there will be nothing left of, of, of our future. They are uh, our future. And because of what I've seen in the thousands of young people that we've supported over the course. I think we started this program in 2010. I was ambassador in Liberia when we sent our first little small cohort of I think three Yali uh, leaders to the United States to meet with President Obama. And then seeing where those three are right now. And we've sent more across the continent every year, uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 young people coming to the United States just for a few weeks. And it's a life changer for them because they get to see their power. They get to see uh, what they can do with, uh, with their skills. And they get to go back to their countries and make a difference. And we're not trying to make them presidents. Initially, African leaders were like, I'm the leader. I don't need you to tell me who's going to be our next leader. We're not trying to make presidents, although I know I can't wait until I see the first Yali who becomes president of a country in, in Africa. So there's one out there, I know, but we want them to be leaders in their community. We want them to be leaders uh, in their businesses. We want them to be leaders in their churches, in their schools, and they will start building the next generation of leaders on the continent. And that's where Africa's future is. And that's what gives me total confidence and faith in, in Africa for the future. As long as we continue to support young people and encourage activities that build their, their leadership skills, this continent, uh, we haven't seen uh, what Africa uh, has uh, to give to the world uh, until we see what these young people are, are able to do.